There's about 24 hours in a day. Seven days a week. That's a lot of time to sit around and contemplate life. And in this day and age, it's impossible to do that without sinking into a deep depression. The terrible thoughts you once forgot come rushing back, flooding your mind. You think to yourself, am I really just a cog in the system? Is there more to life than just living paycheck to paycheck? The crushing weight of the world is almost too much to bear sometimes. You start to wonder if you can even go on like this for much longer. But then you hear it. A faint notification noise from your state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line, Alienware desktop gaming computer. It's none other than Discord. One of your boys hit you up. The question he asked was two words long. Yo, games? And sure, it's League of Legends, but it's enough. Whatever it takes to escape this world you despise, even if you're entering another one that's also hateful. You choose how to spend your time, and you spend it doing things you love, things you enjoy. You know, something like a hobby? Ah yes, the good old-fashioned hobby. They can range from collecting stamps to partaking in weekly bingo games at the community center. It's something everyone has, but I simply don't have time to go over every single person on the planet. And I'm sure most of them would scare us anyway. In this video, we'll be focusing on several people throughout history with hobbies that would make most of you say, Huh, yeah, hey, alright. We start this journey in Mother Prussia. Back to 1713 when kings were more accepted in society. A man crowned king, Frederick William I. He was a man known for challenging corruption and being German. He was more importantly known for prioritizing the expansion of his military forces, but not in the way we would consider normal. See, little Frederick here, although he was small, he had to face a challenge that was even larger than life, and that challenge was vertical limitations. Shout out to my short kings. I'm not one of you, but I feel for you, bro. King Frederick stood no taller than five foot three, and that's on a good day. That's enough to make anyone angry. It's also enough to make anyone develop a hobby that consists of collecting, abducting, and breeding tall hunks to fight for you. King Frederick hired an approximate 40,000 mercenaries to expand his forces, growing from 38,000 to almost 80,000 men. And this is where the plot twist begins. This man had an absolute crush on anything above six foot two, so much so that he created a personal regiment of big burly boys. This squad became known as the Grand Grenadiers, but almost everyone referred to them as the Potsdam Giants or Lange Kerl which technically means the long guys. To be a part of this squad, the only requirement was to be at least six foot two. The taller the better, because you got paid based on upward length. The hunks rolled in from around the world. Some of them volunteered, some were recruited from other armies, and some world leaders sent tall men as gifts to maintain good standing with King Frederick. But King Frederick didn't just want these men. He needed these men, and he would go to any lengths necessary to obtain them. It quickly became an obsession. The king would roll into town and hand father figures large sums of money for their substantial sons. And this isn't even the weird part yet. His thirst for strapping young men grew larger and larger. And as a man with an obsession so drastic normally does, he switched to the eugenics route. The king was on a mission of growth. A jelking session for height, if you will. He started pairing his humongous men with women that looked like the Amazon from Diablo 2. All in hopes to create these gigantic offspring. And the worst part is, there wasn't even a point to this large army. Typically, you'd go out of your way to find absolute specimens to wreak havoc on the battlefield and defend your honor. But that wasn't the role of the Potsdam Giants. In fact, they never even fought for him. He was just so obsessed with being in his own casting couch fantasy. During the King's 27-year reign, the only guns that were fired by the Potsdam Giants were, well, you know, the phallic ones. At first, it sounds like a pretty good life, being blessed with the job of a giant who was more of an ornament than an actual war hero. But it had more downs than ups. A large portion of their day was spent being tortured in hopes to get taller. The men would be strapped onto a special stretching rack constructed by the king. This would pull them lengthwise, and it would cause much more harm than good. Multiple soldiers ended up dying from this medieval procedure. Whenever the king was feeling under the weather, he would form a parade of giants. Hundreds of soldiers would march while being headed by musical instruments, and of course the one and only mascot a king could have, a live bear. King Frederick's reign ended in 1740 when he passed away. He left behind over 2,500 giant men for his son. And thankfully, fetishes aren't hereditary. His son simply had enough of his father's bullshit and sent them all to war as normal combat units. Up next, we'll take a look at King Farouk, who is basically a walking Today I Learned Reddit post. When your full title is His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sedan, I think it's safe to say you're a little full of yourself. Farouk I reigned from 1936 until 1952. And there's a lot of crazy shit that happened during this guy's reign. But we'll just take a look at his favorite hobby. Coin collecting. No, I'm just kidding. We're gonna take a look at his second favorite hobby. Stealing. Now, King Farouk was your typical rich, spoiled monarch. He ate caviar out of the can, he drank 30 bottles of pop a day, 
and owned a plethora of unexplainably crazy shit that you could never even begin to think of. But when you're a man who has access to everything he wants, the simple things in life just don't cut it anymore. And there's just something about petty theft that really gets the heart pumping. Not that I would know or anything. I can only imagine that being a king is pretty boring sometimes, and you have to kill time somehow. And in my opinion, there's no better way to do that than stealing from the people you love the most. King Farouk grew up rather sheltered by his father. He grew up in royal palaces his whole life, and he wasn't allowed to do anything. I'm sure that does a number to someone's mental health, and was probably a contributing factor to his kleptomania in the first place. King Farouk hired a professional pickpocket to teach him how to perfect the art. He would spend hours a day dressed as a commoner and would visit towns, swiping things from people's houses, stores, markets, and museums. As king, you could take anything you want from your people. You had access to everything, but there's no fun in that. You know when you go to the grocery store and your cart is almost at max capacity? There comes time to make a choice. Would you walk out the store paying full price, forcing the minimum wage cashier to scan all of your items, making them deep dive into their cerebellum to remember the code for green peppers? Or would you use the self-checkout and scan all of your items as if they were a bundle of bananas instead? And I mean, I really hope no one ever does that. Ever. Billion dollar corporations that overcharge for basic human necessities are not filled with corrupt people, and you should not treat them as such. Anyway, the latter part of that rant is probably what a king feels like every day. King Farouk's skills were increasing. He stole several items from revered people, and this was all to work towards the biggest heist of his life. A goddamn pocket watch, baby! Woo! But it wasn't just any pocket watch. It was Winston Churchill's pocket watch. The heist took place at none other than a party hosted by the king himself, in Winston Churchill's honor. And being a king who loves to steal, he simply couldn't get enough of that glimmering time teller dangling from his pocket. What better way to get 99 thieving, he thought to himself. He just couldn't keep his fingers away. He slipped the watch out of his pocket and scurried away with it. The entire party came to a screeching halt. A search party was soon formed for this family heirloom. King Farouk quickly realized that his big plan was falling in and out of shambles. He started getting quite worried, so he simply returned the watch and played it off as a joke. Nobody thought it was funny. In the beginning, King Farouk was largely popular. The fans loved him. But as incompetence and corruption grew within his government, that quickly changed. Some communism happened as it normally does, and the US got involved. This caused Farouk to flee Egypt. He ended up leaving behind his car collection, his 2000 silk shirts, and huge pornography collection. He ended up passing away in a completely different country while eating a midnight dinner of oysters and lamb. Dope shit. Finally, we'll take a look at Thomas Jefferson. He was the third president of the United States of America, the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, and a filthy Democrat. And hell, he's probably even a person some Gen Zers know about. But other than all that silly political stuff, what actually makes him interesting? Well, if you're a person who enjoys books, you might be interested in his lifelong hobby of reading, so much so that the man had a whole library. He even had the largest collection of literature of all time at that time. But after the British burned the Capitol and the Congressional Library along with it, Jefferson sold his collection to Congress to have it restored. He sold it for a whopping $24,000. But another more interesting, uh... I guess interest, of his, was sheep. Yeah, a farm animal. When Jefferson was in office, he had over 40 sheep kept on President Square, just out front of the White House. But there was a very special Shetland ram that he kept inside. This ram had four horns and a concealed carry permit. This ram's duty was to act as a lawful protector of Thomas Jefferson. A sheepred service, if you will. There were multiple attacks on unsuspecting pedestrians trying to take a shortcut across the White House grounds, where they would end up meeting their demise. Most of them wound up severely wounded, beaten and bruised by this one special ram. There was one unfortunate case where one young boy ended up losing his life due to this woolly beast. This event led to the ram eventually getting put down so it couldn't wreak any more havoc on lazy civilians. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like and subscribe for future content. Until next time.